In my time spent as an instructor at welding school, I've taught well over a thousand people hands-on training. And I can get their welds from this to this in just the first day. Now I've heard it once and I've heard it a thousand times. In order to strike the arc with a stick rod, we need to strike it like a match. Or maybe we need to tap that electrode. We see the little tip of the rod right here where the flux isn't covering it. That's the contact point that we need to make in order to get this rod lit. So yeah, while tapping and striking like a match can get this rod lit, I found a lot of newbies really take this too literal. And what I mean by that is when we're tapping that electrode to stay lit, we have to maintain a certain arc length. And while they're so focused on tapping and tapping and tapping, they don't actually see when that rod has been lit and they've already started that motion back down into the plate. So you stick to the plate, you get that rod stuck and then your plate gets picked up with your rod. You can just simply put a clamp on your work. Clamping your work's gonna help maintain a nice contact to the plate that has the ground to it. Now, most people will say, let's strike it like a match. How do you strike a match? You put a lot of pressure on the tip and then you flick the snot out of it. So a lot of newbies, tend to do that. They'll end up trying to strike a match and that arc length, they're just turning it off every time. So they're lighting the rod and then turning it off. You have to light that rod and get back to the point where you started. And if you're going so crazy with that arc length, you're turning that electrode off and on, off and on, again, getting more frustrating as it goes. Let's try to marry those two things together and really focus on the tip of this electrode and finesse it a little bit more. Imagine just like a little, little Jiminy Cricket sitting there and you're just trying to knock his top hat off. We're gonna do like a little J motion coming down, gently tapping that tip and trying to stop and pause, I'd say a quarter of an inch to a half inch would be the maximum you need to be away from that plate by the time that arc gets established. So we're kind of just coming in and doing a little J motion, gently tapping that electrode with the good connection and good ground. Once most people get the arc lit, now that rod starts to burn away and now they're having a hard time focusing on what this arc length is all about. Now we have to learn how to maintain the arc. We've actually got a great video on practicing your arc strikes with this video right here, techniques and other stuff, and even relighting your electrodes if you're really having a hard time with that. Arc length is the distance from the tip of your electrode to your base metal that you're welding on. I've seen every new welder do it. They'll strike that arc and they see the arc just go crazy. It's spinning, swirling, dropping bombs, and they're just like mesmerized until that rod completely stops. Or they'll strike up the rod and then they see that long arc and they're just looking at this arc all all the way across. They might see a puddle or something on there, but they're not paying attention to the puddle. You don't need to look at the arc, you need to look at the puddle. We need to calm down that arc by closing our arc length closer to the plate. And again, that rod is burning away from the plate as we weld. So we don't have a choice but to maintain it and keep that rod close to the material. Otherwise, that arc link changes our weld drastically if we're in and out of it. A lot of welders, once they start to see that puddle, it'll strike up and get a good puddle, but again, that rod is burning away. So they're in and out, in and out. As that rod burns, they see it and they try to catch up with it. They see it, they try to catch up with it. Now you're starting to get the gist of it. You're understanding what to see, look for, and that's that puddle. Whatever electrode diameter you're using is the arc link you're trying to maintain. If you have an eighth inch electrode, you're trying to maintain an eighth of an inch away from that material. If you have a smaller rod, like a 332, same thing, 3 30 seconds of an inch away from that material. But come on, what's a 30 second among friends? There's a little bit of a range. It's not that technical. Just keep it close to the material. Some rods run a little different for these 7018s. I always say keep it slow and keep it nice and close in order to make a nice smooth weld. Now you know how to carry a bead. That's great and dandy. Now we gotta make sure we're making good habits. Too many times as an instructor in welding school do I see a student usually on the first or second day and they'll come up with their work all proud and be like, hey, can you check this out? I need to know what I need to be doing. I can't read this and I can read a weld better and I can read a book. I get DMs, people desperate for advice and I have a hard time giving it to them and the only thing that I'll tell them next is you need to focus on overlapping welds. Welding your first speed very straight, as straight as you can and then you need to overlap the weld with your next speed. Aiming for the toe of your weld, the edge of it and covering the weld that you previously did at least halfway to the highest point or the crown of that weld. I know that sounds a little technical, but that's why it's just called overlapping. We simply just want to overlap each weld very intentionally, very uniformly. I could put so many more welds on a piece of material and once I get all the way across, I can go back the other direction. I would have students welding bricks out. They started off with a piece of 3 8 plate and end up with a big chunk of steel because of all the practice they were able to get off of one piece of material. If you weld like this, 
you won't be able to read your welds good enough. And by the time you try to put another layer on, those welds aren't going to look good enough either because you've got a bunch of lumpy, bumpy poop underneath it. Now that you understand exactly what needs to be done on the piece of material, we got to look at the machine because there's not a whole lot to stick welding, but amperage can really bite you in the butt. Now, when it comes to your welding amperage, to professionals, it's pretty easy, but to newbies, it's kind of an enigma because it could change and it could remain the same all in the same instance. You need to understand the rod diameter that you're using, the rod type you're using, and the material thickness that you're using, and the position that it's in. All these things are going to end up changing your amperage. Now, in this instance, a flat piece of plate with a 1 8 70 18, 125 amps is going to do the trick. I can do that over and over and over again in this flat position, even on a quarter inch plate. Now, if I put that plate into the vertical position, that's not going to be the case. It's likely I'll be able to dig a hole to China on that quarter inch plate. However, if I move up in the plate thickness, maybe even up to one inch, we can make it because that material is able to hold a lot more heat and a lot more amperage. Same thing with the rod diameter. If the rod is smaller, you're going to need less amperage in order to power it. And if the rod type is different, 125 amps with a 7018 might be perfect for a flat, but if I change to a 1 8 60 10, 125 amps is going to be very hot. All these things are situational and circumstantial depending on all those variables. So where do you start? You can go online, do a little bit of research, just Google it, or you can watch your favorite YouTube channel. I'm sure you can find whatever you're trying to weld. There's so many of them out there. When it comes to specific rod manufacturers, you can even look up on these guys' websites. ESOB's one of our trusted partners. We have been for years. We love running the machines and the electrodes themselves. You can go online and find the electrode charts there. Sometimes even have them written right here on the actual packaging. They'll give you a range, including the polarities. When it comes to understanding how to read it, you gotta just play with those amperages. So go over to your machine, turn it up, really hot and go ahead and make that weld. You're going to see that that hot weld is going to have a really wide elongated puddle. It's going to freeze a little bit slower because the amperage is a lot hotter. And then, then once you chip the slag off, that weld's going to be really wide, flat. The ripples are going to be kind of pointy or elongated. That's something to look at while you go turn that machine a little bit too cold. So then you strike up the arc and you'll see that that rod's even harder to stay lit. It seems to be a little bit sluggish. You won't even burn as much electrode with a colder rod than say with a hotter rod, obviously. And once you chip the slag on a cold weld, you'll see that it's tall, it's skinny. The toes of that weld don't seem to want to tie into the plate as well. So now you've seen a cold weld, you've seen a hot weld, set that machine now to somewhere in the middle and make a weld. You'll find that you'll have that little happy median of the weld size that you're looking for, the toes are blended in properly, the slag comes off easy, and everything is really uniform. But the only way to really understand that is by welding, practicing and reading your weld and trying to understand what's happening once you make it. When a welder understands how to read a weld, that's when they can become dangerous. Now I might lose some of you welding instructors on this next point. It doesn't matter where you went, to school at, doesn't matter if you started in a shop or wherever, you probably heard burn those rods down to the numbers. And what that means is the designating numbers on the electrode, what they want is you to use the entire electrode all the way down to those numbers. In a perfect world, yes, that's how that works. But in a learning world, it's very difficult. Maybe the weld joint isn't long enough and we just didn't need the whole rod to get across. Or maybe we weld a little bit and got stuck, got frustrated and snapped it off. Or at the start of our tapping and smacking, we messed up the tip of it and it's a little bit foobarred and we don't want to use those rods. A good way to trigger your welding instructor is to go grab a handful of unfinished rods and be like, hey, what do I do with these? When you need to stop, stop. That's for while you're beginning. What I want you to do is not get frustrated whenever you get stuck or whatever and snap that rod off and break it completely. Rather, I want you to get stuck, compose yourself, try to snap that rod off gently and just set it aside get a new rod and keep going. That way you can save a little bit of your sanity. But once you start getting down the process of how this works, you need to start using these old rods. And what I mean by that is if you're welding and you get down to a little bit, then start the next speed and then make a tie-in. I've seen too many times in welding schools where students would want to weld all the way across the plate and they end up welding too quickly with the rod they're using. And I'll say, hey, you welded too fast. And they're like, oh, well, I just wanted to get across in one, one rod. With the stick welding process, we don't have that luxury. You have to learn how to make tie-ins. And that's where this pile of scrap rods is going to come in. Just go ahead and take those when you need one and make your tie-in. There were some students that would get so stubborn with it that I would make them dig into the trash cans or the scrap bins and find used rods. And that's the only rods they got to use that day until they did tie-in after tie-in after tie-in. And it really is simple with your tie-ins, guys. Most of the time, with the 7018 anyway, you'll start ahead, come back, trace the crater, and then burn out the stuff that you lit up in front of it, all that garbage that you started off with. 
Practice the tie-ins. Do a bead where it's just one tie-in after another. It's only going to make you better. In the field, right when I did high-pressure power plants, 100% x-ray to stuff, severe cycle, all that jazz. When it came to a rod that ended up looking like that, that was all messed up, I'm not fixing to use that. I'm not going to spit no porosity into my weld and have to grind it out or risk losing my job over it. I'm just going to get a new rod. But when it comes to learning, you got to get the most out of the material that's in front of you because the more you weld, the better you get. There is no hack to it. You just need hood time. Now look, understanding the perspective of a new welder and kind of looking at a weld through their eyes and really breaking down these fundamentals to the nitty gritty, I think is what's going to make you suck less at stick welding. I appreciate everyone for watching. We'll see you on the next weld.